Thank you. Can you hear me about this thing? This is good. So good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I'm glad I made it. I was just telling the conference organizers I sent a frantic email last night from Dallas saying, I'm not going to make it. The last flight out left. I missed my flight. But fortunately, um, an earlier flight was delayed long enough for me to catch that flight. So I'm operating on little sleep right now. So while I am physically here, I don't know if I'm mentally here. But hopefully, I'll be able to, um, to um, do this presentation. So nursing in 3D. This is an interesting topic to me because this issue of health disparities has been around for a while. It's been around for as long as we've had data on race and health in the United States. But while the issue has been there, the problem has been there, the, we haven't been addressing the problem directly and forth, forthrightly. And conferences like this didn't happen just a, food, a decade ago. So right now, we have a lot of awareness around health disparities. Everyone in this room is here because we're concerned about the issue. We want to try to make progress. But I'd like you to stop for a moment and try to imagine Imagine this society without health disparities. Can you envision that reality? How would we get there? What would have to happen? At its core, the question is asking, why do we have disparities? Why do they exist? And if we can figure out first why we have disparities, then perhaps we can envision a solution to that problem. Can you even imagine it? As I've asked that question, to many audiences, and I won't do it here, I won't ask you to tell me what came to your mind, but unless your minds work differently than everyone else, and I know you're all unique, but you're probably all unique in the same way, <laughs> you're all unique, some ideas pop into your head. Well, if we can only deal with socioeconomic status, if we can only improve access to care, or maybe disparities are immutable. Maybe it's something that can't be fixed because it's really something innate about race groups. Maybe it's genetic. Maybe it's biological. These are the ideas that come into people's heads. Well, while it's hard to imagine not having health disparities in this country today, it wasn't that long ago that I could imagine it because it wasn't that long ago. At least it doesn't feel like that long ago, although in reality, I guess it was long ago when I was in graduate school. I could imagine not having disparities because I didn't know that they existed. So. I was um, in graduate school in sociology, working on a dissertation in political sociology of all things. And if you've written a dissertation, and I know many of you have, so you can relate to this, the tedium, boredom, and isolation of writing a dissertation. I know. You're, you're, you're feeling it, right? So am I taking you back? And you reach that point where you've already pulled your hair out, so you're past that. And I just wanted something to do, anything to do that didn't have to do with a dissertation. So I decided to go out for a walk. And I'm taking this walk in downtown Ann Arbor, Michigan. And if you've been to Ann Arbor, Michigan, and I know several of you have because I've already met some of you from Ann Arbor, you know it was a pretty short walk. <laughs> so I'm walking down the street, and I, want, I find myself wandering into this used bookstore. I head over to the clearance section of the bookstore. So now, let's, 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 let's recap. I'm in the clearance section of the used bookstore. <laughs> now, I did say I was a graduate student, right? So this is what I could afford. So I go over to the, to the clearance section, and I start looking through the books. And I come across this book. This is, the, this is the, the cover of the book, which still sits on my desk at home, A Night to Remember, which is a book about the Titanic which probably says something even more about my state of mind that time. <laughs> now, of course, I know how the story ends, or at least I think I do. The ship goes down and everybody dies, right? This is what, I'm, this is what, I'm, what I know or what I'm thinking at the time. But I'm looking for something to do, something to read, anything that does not have a bibliography in it. And I figured, I figured this would do it. So I start thumbing through this book, and I come across this page where they start talking about Survivors on the Titanic. I was like, wow. Now wait, remember, this was before the movie, okay? 
I've seen the movie, so I know what happened. But at the time, I figured, oh, the ship went down, they died, that's the end of the story. And they're talking about survivors, which I didn't know existed at the time. And they're talking about survivors as a function of the class of ticket that they had. So I start calculating these death rates, which tells you something more about my state of mind at the time. Right? I was a goner by this time. So I'm standing in the clearance section of the used bookstore calculating death rates. Well, OK, I've rechecked those rates, and the numbers are correct. This is what I came up with. A dramatic disparity in who survived based on the class of ticket that you had. Now, this was fascinating, right? Because the whole ship went down. All three cabins went down. Why would it be that even here, your social status mattered? Who you were made a difference. And when you look further into the story, you see why. It's because there was only enough lifeboat space to accommodate 53% of the souls on that ship that night. On the evening of April 15th, 1911, at 11.40 p.m. in the North Atlantic, space on a lifeboat was a scarce resource. And when it comes to scarce resources, who you are determines who gets what. It seems to me a perfect metaphor for the U.S. healthcare system. Big, fancy, shiny, ex uh, expensive ship giving out unequal treatment destined to hit an iceberg and sink. And when it goes down, we're going to get results something like this. Who is most vulnerable will be most greatly impacted. So now, this was 101 years ago, right? This could never happen today. There could never be an ocean, uh, 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 an ocean liner or a mode of transportation that would only have enough lifeboat space for 30, 53% of the people. Is that right? Okay, well this is the ship, the airliner that landed on the Hudson River in New York. And I swear to you, I did not Photoshop this picture except to add coach class and first class. Mm -hmm. Now I talked about my travel challenges last night. You know, next time you, you, you have to click that button to decide whether you want to get that first class ticket or not. I want you to think about this. <laughs> think about this picture and determine whether or not you want to do it. Now, the topic of health disparities or health inequalities really hit the health policy agenda with the publication of unequal treatment. Unequal treatment placed this issue on the front burner of the health policy agenda of the nation. And to my surprise, it's pretty much maintained on that, uh, its position on, that, on the agenda ever since the publication of this report. Now, this is interesting because this was not the first report on health disparities. It wasn't even the first report from the IOM on health disparities. But why has this report been so much more successful than the others? I believe the reason is that in the past, these reports would come out, and they would show chart after chart after chart of disparities. The black rate is this, the Latino rate is that, the Native American rate is that, the white rate is that, and so on and so forth. And then people would say, well, this is really an access to care issue. This is really about patient preferences and patients not being effective patients. Or there would be any number of excuses, but the excuses would be things that don't really lie within the purview of the healthcare industry or the healthcare system to deal with. Personal issues, personal responsibilities, social conditions, problems that were too big for us to fix in the healthcare world. But this report was unique in that it did something very clever. This report is not really a report about health disparities. It's a report about disparities in quality of care among people that had health insurance, showed up in the healthcare system, was able to get access to care, and then asked the question, are there disparities in the quality of the care that they received? So it took all of the excuses off the table and forced us to confront the fact that we had a problem in the healthcare system that we put together. Now, the, re the report has done a great job of placing the issue on the front burner and raising awareness among policymakers. So for example, this is a quote from a prominent national policymaker. The quote says, a key test to any new system 
Can we turn this, the, the microphone down a little bit? It's a little loud for me. A key test to any new system is its ability to provide access to quality care for the poorest and sickest among us. The elimination of health disparities must be a critical goal. No American can be left out. Any idea who that is? Who? Romney? No. no. I get the answer. I don't get the reaction. Why is that funny <laughs> that Romney would say that? It actually was one of his opponents for the Republican nomination for the presidency. Newt Gingrich, former Speaker of the House, made that point. Let's, let's try one more. African American males die sooner than other males do, which means the system is inherently unfair to a certain group of people, and that needs to be fixed. Now you're afraid to guess that one, right? <laughs> it's okay. You won't be graded by it on it. Let's get one. Who is that? President Obama. Close, close. It's his predecessor, President George Bush. So now, of course, the president was not making this statement in the context of announcing a new initiative to fix the problem. <laughs> Rather, he was making the, that comment in the context of arguing that African Americans should support his effort to privatize Social Security because since they died prematurely, they would inherit benefits from their dead family member. But political considerations aside, the fact of the matter is that awareness of the health disparities issue is not a problem among, health, uh, among policymakers. There is a high level of awareness. So the issue is on the, on the agenda now. We move past the issue of awareness and we move towards how do we make and craft arguments that bring more people. Can we turn the microphone down, please? I'm hearing an echo. It's very loud up here. And maybe even turn this microphone off, if you could. It's just too loud. So we move beyond awareness and we move towards solutions. How do we fix the problem? What do we then do about it? How do we motivate action around the issue of health disparities? So, the group that I lead at the Hopkins Center for Health Disparity Solutions, we got the idea that perhaps we can move the argument for health disparities beyond the social justice argument. Now, let me be clear. I'm not suggesting that it's not a social justice issue. Clearly, this is a social justice issue. Health disparities should be addressed because they are wrong, because they are inconsistent with American values, and they are inconsistent with the society that we all want to live in. But I think we've gotten as many people under the tent as we're going to get with the social justice argument. And we got the idea that perhaps we can come up with another set of arguments, a utilitarian argument, an economic argument. Perhaps we can demonstrate that health disparities affects us all, affects the entire country, the entire economy. If we can calculate the economic impact of health disparities, and we calculated that cost to be $1.24 trillion over three years when you consider lost productivity, people not being as productive as they should be because of their health. When you consider premature death, that we as a society invest in people, but then they don't live long enough for the society to fully reap the benefit of that investment. And when you consider the direct medical costs, people are using more health care uh, resources than they should otherwise need to use because they're sicker than they ought to be. This affects all of us. So the health disparities problem is a national problem. It affects military readiness. It affects every aspect of our society. And it's not something that is only to be left to people focusing on minority health or the minorities themselves who are trying to deal with the emotional impact of the problem of health disparities. So that when, when, they, when someone argues that we can't address health disparities because it costs too much money, it costs money to create a new program. It costs money to change policy. It costs money to do things differently than the way we've been doing things. The counter is it also costs us money to do nothing. It's a cost that we bear as a society, and it's a cost that we should no longer bear. So what is health disparities? The first of the three, the three Ds. Health disparities. This chart, I think, pretty much sums it up for me. I used to update this chart every year 
And in 2003, I guess I just got tired of it because it's the same chart. It's the same pattern, and it hasn't changed. Trust me, if we got 2011 data, it would look like this. The disparities are dramatic. The disparities are by gender as well as by race. And one thing I have to point out here is that black women's age-adjusted mortality rate is, is higher than most men of any other racial and ethnic group. This, at its core, is what the health disparities problem is about in terms of overall total mortality. A couple of quick examples of health care disparities, that is disparities in quality of care or disparities that, that relate to different conditions, outcomes that people receive within the healthcare system. This is from the study of uh, Medicare patients. So all of these patients have the same insurance. So we, this is not an access problem. And these are all patients, of course, that got access to care and used that access. If you just focus on the top line, I think it pretty much sums it up, looking at amputations. More than three times more likely, African Americans, three times more likely to, be, to receive an amputation compared to white Americans, which, as you all know, is typically the result of long-term, poorly maintained and managed diabetes. Now, this one is a study from some guy named Leviste who did this study in Baltimore. And I, I guess I owe it to my employer to say that Johns Hopkins was not one of the hospitals in this study, although I have every reason to believe that the results would be exactly the same if it were. But this is from three hospitals in Baltimore. We went into the medical records. We abstracted over 10,000 um, medical records to identify patients that were appropriate candidates for cardiac catheterization that were insured and that were seen at the hospital. And what we find here, each of these patients should have been referred for catheterization. They were all candidates for referral. And we see two things here. We see that we have an overall quality problem Right? because not all the white patients were referred either. And again, I stress, these are insured patients that had insurance that would have paid for the procedure. This was a medically indicated procedure. And the hospitals should have been and was entitled to be reimbursed for providing a service that was medically indicated and appropriate. So this is not a simple economic issue, right? because this was money that the hospitals left on the table. And so it was really just about the money 100% of these patients would have received the procedure. But not only do we have an overall quality problem, when we look at the disparity by race, we have a huge disparities problem in the quality of care that's received. So another argument that we can make within the healthcare system is that by not providing services that are indicated for patients that have the ability to pay, we're not, we're not getting the revenue that we should be capturing because we should be providing this care. So we move beyond just social justice, and we try to make arguments that produce the outcomes that will be equitable if we can build those, those arguments. Here's another study that I really like, and this is the last one I'm going to show you. This is from the VA hospital in Pittsburgh, where they're looking at revascularization. And of course, these are all VA patients, so um, ability to pay shouldn't be in it. It should be pretty similar across the patients, and we see a great disparity. We see only 50% of the white patients who should have been revascularized were, but the disparity is even greater because fewer than 30% of the black patients. So we've got a quality problem in America, and we've got a disparity in quality problem. And I think that the argument for addressing health inequalities the argument for addressing health inequalities within the healthcare system is the argument that says this is a quality issue. We're not providing the quality of care. This is a social justice issue. We're not providing the care that people need and deserve. This is an economic issue. We're not generating the revenue that we should be generating if we provided the services that we ought and can and should be providing. So now, one of the approaches that we talk about to addressing this is diversity, increasing the diversity of the healthcare workforce. And this chart is from the Commonwealth um, Fund's Minority Health Survey, where they ask uh, respondents to the survey about the race or ethnicity of their primary care provider. And what I've done is I've, in red, have, I've highlighted 
where people are concordant, patients are concordant with their health care provider. Now these were, these were people who in the survey said that they had the ability to choose their own health care provider. So they felt they had choice and that these is, this is what they've chosen to do. So in every case, patients were more likely to choose a provider of their own racial or ethnic group when they had the choice and the ability to exercise that choice. For example, whites are about 71% of the U.S. population, but more than 85% of them have white doctors. Blacks are about 13% of the U.S. population, but more than 21% of them have black doctors. Hispanics, more 13% of the U.S. population, almost 19% of them have Hispanic doctors. And Asian Pacific Islanders are about 4% of the U.S. population, 52% of them have Asian Pacific Islander physicians. So when given the option, and, be, and when given the ability to exercise that choice, every racial or ethnic group in the United States is more likely to exercise that choice in favor of being race concordant. But when we look at, oh, and when we look at the consequences, this is just three studies that we've done on race concordance and health outcomes. In each case, we find greater levels of patient satisfaction if they're race concordant, regardless of their race. We also find more likely to utilize services more quickly and utilize those services adequately and less likely to delay in help seeking if they're race concordant. So clearly patient behavior seems to be that if they have the ability to exercise choice, they exercise that choice towards being race concordant and if they are race concordant, they do tend to express greater satisfaction. But when we look at the healthcare workforce, this is physicians from the U.S. Census. We see that the distribution of the physicians in the country does not produce the ability to fully provide for the race concordance that we think that would be demanded by the population. So it seems race concordance is an unlikely solution in the short term to the problem of disparities. How do we modify the training that we receive in nursing, in medicine, in public health, in all the clinical sciences, all of the places where we're impacting patients. How do we change that training so that we can produce the same outcomes in spite of the fact that we are not race concordant? Seems to me that's the question. Now we've done a lot around this issue of health disparities, at least in the, especially in the last decade or so. But I'm sorry to say that I believe that much of what we are doing or have done is going to fail. Sorry to dep depress you. I think that because what we've done is we started throwing solutions out before we made a diagnosis. It would be like a patient coming to see you and you just start prescribing stuff. Now there's a chance that you will randomly hit upon the right solution and you'll have something that will be good for this patient. But your odds of having a good outcome are better if you first stop and do the diagnosis. So let me talk about a couple of the diagnoses that I hear when I talk to people about disparities and, and talk about how that diagnosis, I think, leads to wrong, wrongly directed solutions. And then I'll end by talking about what I think is the diagnosis for the health disparities problem. So the first diagnosis I want to talk about is bad genes. So the idea is here is that there's this gene or genes or gene mutation or gene variant that, that exists within certain racial groups. So there's a black gene that only black people have and that gene causes you to have hypertension, diabetes, stroke, and cancer, and HIV, and homicide, and it makes you able to dance better, and it makes you a better athlete, <laughs> and it also makes you black, right? Now that's absurd, right? That's an absurd idea, right? We know genes don't work that way, and we know there's no such thing. But how many times do we, in very subtle ways, fall into that type of thinking? I'm going to tell you a story about a, a conversation I had just last week with a, a colleague of mine. Now, let me say, this, this colleague of mine I've known for many years. I know this person to be a well-meaning person who intended no harm. An intelligent person who was trying to get an answer to a question. So I, 
in the lunchroom, uh, cafeteria, having lunch, right? This is what you do in the lunchroom, right? And I went into him, he says, hey, I have, I have a question for you. You know, I'm doing this study, and I'm getting these findings, and I'm just having a hard time figuring out what these findings mean. I said, okay, which, what is it? Well, we've tanked the genomes of, of uh, patients in our study. And we have black patients and white patients, and we have patients from East, uh, West Africa as well. And we're finding dramatic variation among the African Americans, much more so than we're finding among the West Africans. Now, everybody knows that the Africans that were brought here as slaves that came to Maryland came from the area that is now known as Cameroon. And the Africans that were brought to South Carolina were from Nigeria. He just went on about this whole map of what part of Africa led to which part of the United States. And I'm sitting there saying, wow, I didn't know that history. Oh, it's interesting. OK, fascinating. He said, but all this genetic variation, it doesn't make sense. Much more variation than we find in, in Cameroon. And I say to this guy, I said, you know what your problem is? I said, I said this, here's, your, here's your solution. The problem is that you are remembering what you learned in college and graduate school, but you're forgetting what you learned in the fifth grade about world history, right? Your entire education counts, right? Not just what you learned in college, but what you learned in kindergarten counts, like be polite, you know, don't, don't spill the milk, that sort of stuff. That all matters still, right? I'm gonna say, but, but go back to the fifth grade. Your fifth grade education about history, does that, is that consistent with what you just said to me? Are African Americans genetically West African? Or are they genetically West African and European and Native American and a combination of every, everything? Yes, yes. Well, wouldn't you expect that there would be a great deal of genetic variation among African Americans given what we learned in the fifth grade? Oh, yes. But see, with this type of thinking creeps into the way that we operate in very subtle ways. Was another colleague of mine, another well-meaning friend doing research. I won't say what the outcome was because it might, you might figure out who, who this is and I don't want to make this person look bad because it's really not my intent. So this, this article gets published and, oh, if you ever want to amuse yourself one day, you have, some, you have a few minutes to kill, go to Google and type in the words, gene found four. Gene found four and then blank and let the hilarity begin. <laughs> but the, num the genes that are found that cause some of the most, the funniest one was gene found for commitment phobia. <laughs> so there were these mice that wouldn't take mates and they had this genetic uh, characteristic and they found a gene that makes men not want to get married. I was like, <laughs> wow. It's fascinating stuff. It's, it's funny. You can have a, you can just really, um, if you're having a bad day, just say, you know what, let me just check this out. Let me just laugh at some of this stuff. So anyway, this friend finds a gene that explains disparities in some outcome, which will remain uh, nameless. And I'm like, wow, that's, that's wonderful. I mean, great. You got the gene. Now we got the gene. Let's switch the gene off. Or let's do something to make the gene not do what it's doing. And we've got the solution, right? We can all go home. So I'm talking to him. It's an article in the newspaper where I, was where I learned about it. So I call him up and I say, wow, you know, what's... I said, so how many people in the study have the gene and have the disease? Oh, about 6%. Oh. Well... Anybody have the condition and not have the gene? Oh, yeah, lots of people. <laughs> well, actually, it was a gene mutation. It was a gene variant is what it was. So, okay. Anybody have the gene variant and not have the condition? Oh, yeah, sure. So 6% of people with the disease has the gene variant. What percentage of people without the gene variant have the disease? About 3%. Now, here we go. Fun with math. If you have the gene variant, the risk of having the disease doubles from 3% to 6%.
And we get an article in a prominent national magazine about this 6% increase. I mean, this, I'm sorry, 100% doubling of your risk of this condition. Now, this is not to say that genes are not important. Genes are vitally important. But without the context and without the nuance, to put that information out into the public creates confusion. Now, speaking of confusion around this issue, I'm sure I don't have to do, explain too much what this drug is. So let me ask anyone here not familiar with Baidu. So, okay. I see a few hands. I'm going to give a really quick Reader's Digest version of the story of Baidu. So for those of you that are familiar with the drug, please forgive me for leaving out a lot of stuff and dumbing it down. But okay, Baidu. So in the 1970s, this new class of drugs are coming out. Calcium channel blockers, beta blockers, all address cardiovascular disease. And these drugs are very, are very effective, right? So some uh, physicians start to see that using these new drugs in combination with two generic drugs are having, having good effect, good benefit. Well, this is wonderful, right? This combination therapy is good. So someone gets the idea that what if we, we should do a study, we should do a trial to demonstrate if this is really the case or this, or, or these really just anecdotal um, experiences. So they do a study, publish it in the New England Journal of Medicine that shows great benefit to patients by using this combination therapy, right? This is great. You would think it would end there, but no. Then they say, okay, what if we take these two generics, we put them together into one pill, commercialize the pill, we get a patent, commercialize the pill, and then there would be a financial windfall for that. So they do that, they get the patent. And then they're ready to try to come to market with the new drug. And FDA says, no, I'm sorry. What's the problem? Well, the trial you did that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine was fine, but it didn't meet FDA standards. You need to do a new trial. So now there's not enough time to do a new trial and then still bring the drug to market and get the financial windfall before the drug comes off patent. So what do you do? What you do is you do some data mining. They go back to the original data and they do some data mining and they find that the drug is more effective in blacks. Now, stop there. You've heard this terminology, right? The drug is more effective in blacks. I've heard it, I've seen it many times. Now let's, exp let's talk about what that means. Let's say we had a drug. We have black patients and white patients, just to keep it simple. And we do a trial. And we find that 85% of the black patients that got the drug benefited. And 75% of the white patients that got the drug benefited. And that would be a phenomenal result, wouldn't it? We'd be really happy with those types of numbers. Those are big numbers. But that 10 percentage point difference between 75 and 85 percent would be statistically significant. Are you with me? Okay. You can give me some feedback. I know we're not in church, but you can give me some, some call and response. You know, oh, I didn't ask for applause, but just give me some feedback. It's early. You know, I didn't get much sleep last night. Okay. That 10 percent would be statistically significant. And when we get this statistically significant difference, the terminology that we often use is the drug is more effective in blacks. But let's examine that statement. Is, under that scenario I just gave you, is the drug more effective in blacks? Is it? Or is the drug effective in a larger percentage of blacks? Right? Because if you're part of the 75% of white patients that benefited, you benefited. You didn't, you didn't benefit less than any black patient, you benefited. If you were part of the 85% of black patients that benefited, you benefited. You benefited the same way as the white patient, not more. So the drug is not effect, more effective in blacks, it's effective in more blacks. Subtle difference, but extremely important difference. Now, my assumption has always been, because I am at heart a very optimistic person, my assumption has always been that when people use terminology like that, they really understood the nuance of what that meant. And they didn't literally mean that the drug was more effective in black people. It was a shorthand. Increasingly, 
I'm beginning to think that maybe my optimism is unfounded. <laughs> because they then go back to FDA and they say, look, we did more analysis and we published another article in, let's just say, a much more obscure journal, in the New England Journal, by the way, and look, at the drug is more effective in blacks. Give us a new patent, this time for use only in black patients. And what do you think FDA does? FDA gives them the new patent for the use in only black patients. So now they do a new trial only among black patients, and what do you think they find? That Bidil is effective. Now, why do they find that Bidil is effective? Because Bidil is effective. Bidil has always been effective. It'd be effective among Eskimo patients, black patients, Hawaiian, you name a group, It's because it's an effective drug. So they go back to FDA and they say, look, the trials show that Bidil is effective. And the FDA gives them permission to commercialize the drug and bring it to market. This happened in 2005, not 1905, 2005. So my question to you then is, who gets Bido? You're in your treatment room and a patient walks in and you say, this patient might benefit from Bido. Who do I prescribe it to? Because I can only prescribe it to African Americans. So do I prescribe it to this African American gentleman who has one grandparent from Scotland, one grandparent from Ireland, and two grandparents from Jamaica? This is Colin Powell. Do I prescribe it to this African American gentleman who has two grandparents from Kenya and two white American grandparents? This is President Obama. Do I prescribe it to this African American gentleman Okay, this guy's got one Chinese grandparent, one Thai grandparent, one white American grandparent who has Native American ancestry, and one black American grandparent who has white American and Native American ancestry. From whom did he inherit his bidual receptor? <laughs> and how do I know that sitting across the table from him in the treatment room? What about this guy? Do I, do I prescribe it to this guy? Looks like a black guy to me. But of course, this is Vijay Singh, who is from Fiji and is not an African American at all. So do we give it to him? Hopefully he'll never need it, but do, do we give it to him? So this is the complexity, complexity. This is the illusionary nature of race. It's a powerful, powerful illusion. And we often get fooled by that illusion into thinking that we see something that we know isn't really there. Fifth grade history. So the next diagnosis I want to quickly talk about is this issue of race disparities really being about socioeconomic status. And it comes down to this, the fact that there's confounding between race and social class because we know that racial ethnic minorities are more likely to be of lower income in this country. So sometimes it's confusing to know whether or not the problem is really being caused by race or is it really a social class issue. So I put together a few charts here. This is from the Health Interview Survey, looking at disparities in health outcomes by race within education levels and showing that across all ed education levels, we still find gaps. This one on infant mortality, I would point out that black women with college educations have higher infant mortality rate than white women with less than a high school education. So now, we have any researchers in the room? It's okay to admit it, it's okay. No, it's all right, good, all right. All right, so a quick message to the researchers. Non-researchers, bear with me while I get a little researchy here, but I need to make a couple of points for the researchers. Now, I know that the researchers were thinking when I showed those charts, oh, well, we have a way of dealing with that. We deal with that problem through something that they call multivariate modeling. A fancy schmancy statistical whiz bang thing that magically allows us to make comparisons between groups, right? At least that's the way we're taught it is in bio, in bio statistics. So I'm gonna do this quick research wonky thing for the researchers in the room 
that I hope will uh, enlighten them. And among the non-researchers, I hope that it won't bore you too much, but please bear with me. So I'm going to do a little a quick analysis here with three variables, race, income, and ADL. ADL is activities of daily living. It is a measure of physical functioning, or you might think of it as disabilities in a way. Okay, now I'm using the National Health Interview Survey, which is the official record of the health of the United States population. It is the most standardized, standard data set that we have, the most official. And we're gonna look at all adults in the National Health Interview Survey over age 40, of which there are over 33,000. So this is a big data set, right? And I'm gonna see whether or not we can use multivariate modeling to account for income and look at race differences in having just one limitation in acti daily activity. So can someone confirm to me, for me, that I have set the bar pretty low by saying one ADL limitation? Right. So the researchers can confirm to the non-researchers that I'm not gaming this, right? Okay, now this is the way we're taught to do, to do this in our fancy schmancy biostatistics class. The first thing we would do is we would look at the relationship between race and having one ADL limitation. And I've done that. And these results tell us, the odds ratio of 1.46 tells us that African Americans have 46% greater odds of having an ADL limitation compared to whites. Am I right so far? So I'm passing? Good. The confidence interval tells us that this is a statistically significant finding. The next thing we do is we look at income. And we see that as income increases, the odds of having an ADL limitation decreases. The confidence interval tells us that this is statistically significant, right? So, so far, I'm, I'm, I'm right, okay? I'm, I'm past, so I've passed Biostat 101. Now it's time for Biostat 102. Now, the next thing we do is we bring race and income together to see what happens. And when we do that, we see that the income effect stays the same. As income increases, the odds of having an ADL limitation decreases. But look at the race effect. It got smaller and it became not statistically significant. Now, can someone confirm that I, that I did this correctly? All right? Thank you very much. Thank you. So I pass 102. Now, what we do next is now we write an article, we get promoted, we get a raise, and all is right with the world, right? Except that we have now added false information to the literature because if we had simply done this, arrayed the data by race and income and looked in every category, we would see that our fancy schmancy multivariate model masked a few important things. First of all, among this lowest income group of $20,000 or less, we see that there is, in fact, a statistically significant race difference and ADL limitation. And if we look at the highest income group, we would see that among people with incomes over $75,000, only eight African Americans have at least one ADL limitation which means that I have calculated a rate based on only eight cases. Do you feel confident calculating a rate based on eight cases? Now, this is the National Health Interview Survey, over 33,000 people in this data set. How many articles have you seen published in journals with much smaller samples much more complex analysis, and many more variables. Is anyone here getting depressed? Okay, now, before I go any further, let me also, let me, let me try to alleviate some of that for you. If you go into PubMed and you put my name into the system there, you will find that I have committed some of the same sins that I'm talking about right now. So the point is not let he who is without sin cast the first stone. The point is to become enlightened, repent, go forward, and sin no more, right? So 
if you find me doing this after 2012, you have the right to call me out about it. Okay? So how many articles do we rely on and how much do we think we know about health disparities on the basis of studies that have this flaw? Studies are smaller data sets making bigger claims but probably having the similar problem. Scary, isn't it? Well, let me scare you a little bit more. This is a picture of a high school in the Baltimore metropolitan area. This is a private high school, please don't say the name if you know it, private high school in the Baltimore area. As I'm taking this picture, I'm at the entrance of the school on the campus, and we see trees and we see a lawn, and as I drive onto the campus, we see more lawn and some of the buildings in the background where the students take classes. As I come around to the side of the campus, here's the gymnasium where the basketball and wrestling and gymnastics and volleyball team perform in this high school in the Baltimore metropolitan area. Here's another high school. This is an upper middle class suburb, public high school in the Baltimore metropolitan area. I'm at the entrance of the building again. There's a lawn, the trees. Come around to the side of the building. Here's the soccer team going out for its afternoon practice on a wide open field. Notice there are no, no bleachers for spectators to watch the baseball game there. As I come around to the back of the building, here are the portable classrooms because in this upper middle class suburban high school in the Baltimore metropolitan area, the building is not large enough to accommodate all the students. And finally, here's a high school in the Baltimore metropolitan area. There's no lawn, but if you look closely, there are some weeds in the cracks there at the curb. <laughs> and there's a tree. Now, my point to all the researchers. All of the graduates of these institutions are in your data sets coded as high school graduates. Do you think that perhaps there are differences in the life chances and opportunities of the graduates of these institutions. You think? Do you think that there are perhaps race differences in who goes to which of these institutions? So when you do your fancy schmancy multivariate model and you've adjusted for education and you think that you've now accounted for that inequality and you're able now to make true comparisons between groups, I want you to think of this slide. Just before you hit enter, think of this slide. Have I really created an ability to do a true comparison of race differences? I think I'm depressing some people here. Okay, okay, non-researchers, you can, you can clue back in. So, social determinants. I know that Paula Braveman was here, so I won't spend too much time on this. I'm talking about what do we mean by social determinants. I was going to get into that but I'm sure you've got that. I just have here some examples of the way that I think about social determinants as an individual level characteristic and the way that that characteristic of the person leads to their ability to function within a society, impacts the way that they're treated, impacts the resources and opportunities that they gain. But there's also this contextual kind of issue that you can be a higher income person but living in a lower income environment and then that will constrain the opportunities that you may have in spite of your own individual characteristics as a function of where you're living and the environment that you're in. So I'm sure that's been covered very nicely. The United States is a very racially segregated society and segregation is what I, I think one of the most important social determinants that impacts health disparities. This is a chart from a report that we did last year looking at the census from 2000 and 2010 and the two charts are showing you all U.S. cities of 100,000 or more and plotting their level of segregation. And segregation here is being uh, measured by the index of dissimilarity. The way you look at that statistic, the higher the number, the more segregated it is. Um, we see that on average, the average American city is 61% segregated in 2000 and 57% uh, and segregated in 2010, which means that um, 57 percent of African Americans would have to move to another part of the country, another part of the city, to make that city racially integrated. I'm going to have to move a little more quickly here, unfortunately. This is a similar ana analysis for Hispanics. Segregation, we know, has effects on health disparities through exposure to health risks, and several articles have documented that. Greater exposure to environmental hazards, targeting for tobacco and alcohol, exposure to stressful environments, 
It also has implications for the ability to access resources that are helpful, healthcare, quality food, jobs, so on and so forth. This pic these pictures are ubiquitous in North and East Coast cities. These are all from Baltimore, and some of these, like this one, is from just a few blocks from my office. These are liquor stores, or what we call corner stores, where they sell pretty much liquor, cheap wine, malt liquor, cigarettes, lottery tickets. This is my favorite one. This is on North Avenue, if you're ever in Baltimore, North Avenue near Greenmont. I did not Photoshop this either. L&M Liquor. I love this picture because of the, the truth in advertising. They sell beer, wine, and medicine. Of course, the medicine that they sell is the elixir for the ills of poverty, malt liquor. And yes, that is a 64-ounce bottle of malt liquor. We did a study to document the location of these stores by looking at their census tracts and found that they were almost exclusively located in low-income and predominantly African-American communities. The differences in the risk environment that we live in expose us to different risks. And this is what's manifested in these national statistics looking at disparities. I have, um, I'm running low on time, so I'm going to have to quickly try to tell a, a very fast story about a, an article that came to, uh, for me to review from another big fancy journal. And this article had a title, something like, um, Race Differences in Firearm Use Among Black and White Adolescent Males. You see in those titles, right? right? So this article comes, and unfortunately for this, for this author, they use data from Maryland, and the journal sent the, the article to someone that lives in Maryland to review it. So as I'm reading the description of the sample, I know these places they're talking about. And what I detect is that the white males all come from Allegheny and Garrett County, which is where I was on vacation just last week. Beautiful part of the country, but let's just say not very diverse. The black males were all from Baltimore City, and specifically East Baltimore. The white males were shooting long guns or rifles. The black males were shooting handguns. The white males were shooting at wildebeests or <laughs> whatever, whatever you shoot at in Allegheny and Garrett County. And the black males were shooting at Right? Now, when I was up at the big, the big school in Ann Arbor, I learned all sorts of statistical trickery to get data to confess pretty much anything you wanted to confess. But I don't know the tricks that makes that a comparison of race. It's a comparison of urban versus rural, maybe. It's a comparison of one type of hunting culture versus a different type of hunting culture, maybe. But in order to do a comparison of race, we would need to have black males living in Garrett and Allegheny County, in which there are some. I actually saw them just last week. And you'd need to have some white males from East Baltimore, of which there are some because I actually see them every day when I go to my office. So, and they actually are doing some of the same things the black males are doing. So we got this idea that what if we could find communities throughout the country that were racially integrated and did not have race differences in education or income? What would be the nature of health disparities if we could, could account for these social determinants, fully account for the social determinants? So we went out, we identified a criteria of 35% African American and 35% white living in the same census tract and have uh, with uh, uh, similar levels of education and income and said, can we find communities like this? There are 68,000 census tracts in the United States. How many do you figure met that criteria? So I said three. <laughs> 425. Okay. Most of them in the Mid-Atlantic, many of them in Baltimore. We put together two of those tracks that were contiguous in Baltimore, and we did a data collection and said, we're gonna, we replicated the health interview survey and NHANES and said, if, what would we find? Are the results going to be the same when you have people living in the same risk environment versus the national findings where people are very segregated? And let me just quickly show you what we find. I'm going to skip through some of this. because This is the, the, so the community was about 44% white, and I can't see that number from here, 51% African American. Median income was very low, but no disparities by race and income. Poverty levels, very high, but no, no significant disparities in poverty levels. Education, it's about the same. 
So this is about as close as you can come. Gender, blue is female and red is male. This is about as close as you can come to a naturally occurring laboratory environment where you can really do an example a study like this. So it was a 40 minute interview, blood pressure was our primary outcome, um, but we replicated the questionnaire from the health interview survey at NHANES as well. So the analysis that we do is to compare the same exact analysis using the federal data set or the national data set and then in our integrated community to see that we find the same disparities. This just shows how well we represented the community and I think we did a pretty good job of representing the community and I'll, I'll skip through this. So we run the analysis, here we're looking at hypertension. We run the analysis in NHANES and then we run the same analysis in our study and we did, again, we followed the NHANES protocol and the health interview survey protocol in, in doing this. And if you just focus on the top line with the model where it says NHANES model one, 2.25, that means 125% greater odds of being hypertensive if you're black compared to white in NHANES, which is typically what we hear, double the, double the, the rate of hypertension. In our community, in the EDIC community, we get an odds ratio of 1.48, meaning 48% greater odds. So we still do find a disparity by race, but that disparity is dramatically smaller than you find in the national statistics. We do, um, here we just plotted the odds ratio just so you can see that. We do a similar analysis for obesity. So 87% greater odds of black women being obese compared to a white woman in the national data. In our sample, only 25% difference, and that difference is not statistically significant. So we find no race difference in obesity among women when they're living in the same risk environment. This is diabetes. 61% greater odds of being diabetic if you're in the national study. In our community, we find 7% greater odds, not statistically significant. So again, no race difference in diabetes when people are living in the same risk environment. So when you think about what is likely the diagnosis, the etiology, the cause of health disparities? It's more likely the social determinants. It's more likely the fact that we live in different environments with different levels of exposures to risk and different levels of availability of resources that we need for healthful life than it is something inherent to different racial or ethnic groups, such as genetic makeup or even behavior. So I'm gonna, I do want to get into make this last point here. Well, actually, there's two points. We're here to talk about health disparities at this conference, but there are, in fact, four great disparities. And these disparities could cause each other and are caused by each other. They're all part of the same system, the same complex web of social inequality that produces the outcomes that we're concerned about. And until we realize that we need to integrate our issue, our disparity, with these other meetings that are happening all over the other parts of the city, we're going to not really find a solution. We know that education and health are linked, that health create, ill health produces worse health outcomes for children, but then also lower levels of education produces worse health, worse health outcomes. That people who have better educations are less likely to wind up incarcerated, and that if you're incarcerated, you're less likely to get an education. We know that people that have the wealth are more likely to afford high quality legal services and not wind up incarcerated in the first place. And the best way that I can think of to ensure that people do not develop wealth is for males to be in prison between the ages of 17 and 34, which is the period of life where most people develop the human capital to create wealth. The wealth and health relationship is well known, and we know that people wind up in prison because of untreated and undiagnosed mental health conditions, and that they often come out of prison sicker than they were when they went in. Now, none of this was news, should be news to anyone in this room. But it's the way that we approach the issue. We approach it within silos, not accounting for the fact that health is merely the outward manifestation of underlying societal inequality. My final point, because I know I'm out of time. Since I have a captive audience here, I have to deal with this issue, my, my personal crusade to address this issue. How many of you know that there are more black men in prison than there are in college? Raise your hand. Okay, have you ever bothered to pull the statistics and see if that's really true? Well, I have. So in 2006, the most recent data that I was able to get, there were 836,800 black men in prison. Now that number is too high, and nothing that I say should be construed as me suggesting that that number is acceptable or appropriate, because it is not. But in that same year, there was 896,000 black men in college. 
So there is, in fact, more black men in college than in prison. Now, the prison population is age 18 and above. The college age population is typically in their 20s. So what if we limited this analysis to just people in their 20s? In that year, 310 black men in prison, 480,000 black men in college. I don't know if it was ever true that there were more black men in prison than in college, but I know that it certainly is not true in the most recent data that I've been able to get. This doesn't even account for the fact that you can be in prison and in college at the same time. It doesn't account for the fact that you can be in prison at one point in the year and in college at a different point in the year. And it doesn't account for the fact that in prison, people are being moved around all the time and they're dual counted. I suppose that if we could do that, we would find that the gap in favor of college is probably even higher than this. So I appeal to you to join me in my one-man crusade to dispel this terrible lie and myth that has been permeated about more black men being in college, less black men being in college than in prison. So in the beginning, I asked you to imagine a society without health disparities and how we would get there. And some ideas, I'm sure, pop into your heads. I asked that you examine what you thought in the beginning of this lecture, and hopefully, by the end of the lecture, your thoughts may have changed, or at least maybe challenged some of the things that you're thinking about what produces the disparities. The next question is, how do we fix them? The idea that there are black genes and white genes and the black genes produce uh, diabetes and hypertension and stroke and cancer and heart disease and HIV and homicide and all the other things that kill us is an absurd idea. Challenge that thinking. The best science we have tells us that there is a unitary origin of modern humans out of East Africa. Our religious traditions teach us that there is the single origin of humanity, that we are one people, that there is truly one race, the human race, and that the illusion of race based on differences in the physical manifestations of the body is an illusion that we play a great deal of attention to. We build a great deal of meaning around, and we create differences and opportunities and differences and risks and the creation of those differences produces the disparities that we're talking about here today. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Do we take questions or do I? You don't do that. Okay. Okay. Let me turn. Thank you again, Dr. Thomas Lavise. When I think of uh, when I think of Imagine, um, when you put that slide up, uh, what comes to mind for me? Um, I, when I think of Imagine, I confess what comes to mind is John Lennon, Dr. Martin Luther King, um, Albert Einstein. Um, I assure you, moving forward, when I see Imagine, I will be including Dr. Thomas Leviste, and I know that uh, many others will be thinking that as well. Thank you. And in the interest of time, we've got to move some, we, we, we'd hope to include some Q&A with Dr. Leviste, and I'm sure someone has a question for him. I want to encourage you to approach him during the break. And we need to take a break before our next speaker, and give our uh, awardees that... Uh, I've got some recognition for their posters to take a picture next door. So we're going to take a 10-minute break. I really want to invite you to help us stay on time because we've got a jam-packed morning. Has this morning not been amazing already? We've got more in store. So please come back in 10, and uh, we're going to keep the ball rolling. Okay? Thank you.